Hi, everyone. This is again Arjen from the Amsterdam office of Effectory. You're live in our Effectory broadcast. More than welcome. And I'm very happy that you're joining us for a really cool interview and a presentation by a well-known guest, Mr. Richard Sutton, live from South Africa, from the Joburg office where he's working. You're in our Effectory broadcast, and at the Factory, we're the European market leader for effective employee listening and feedback. And we're very much involved in the field of HR and strategic business development. Within the C-suite, there's an increasing level of involvement for HR, including employee experience as a key KPI next to financial well-being or customer MPS. For this series, we invite inspiring guests to share with us the latest trends in HR and the business community. And you might have seen our other webinars or our other podcasts about topics like performance management, diversity and inclusion, technological unemployment, employee experience, uh, purpose in work, and what have you. All these recordings can be found on our Effectory YouTube channel. And we're more than happy to keep inviting you for the next coming up webinars on all these other interesting topics like technological unemployment, um, the future of work, industrial revolution, et cetera, et cetera. However, today we'll be talking about stress and inspirational leadership. Our guest speaker, as I said, is Richard Sutton. He's a global speaker, a postgraduate lecturer in the areas of pain management, health, athletic development. And already for two decades, he's been teaching on this topic to a diverse group of CEOs, C-level so elite athletes. He's an expert in the area of stress management. He's author of the book, The Stress Code, From Surviving to Thriving. And my personal favorite, and, and I mean, from this impressive list of achievements, is his coaching of athletes. Just a few to name, like Roger Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, the, the Williams sisters, they're just in his list of people that he has coached how to deal with their stress levels to increase their performance. In the next 45 minutes, we'll be drawing the relationship with our mental well-being and making sure to be future-proof as a business. How do you inspire your people as a leader to bring them through this global pandemic, this stressful crisis? Stress, it's one of those elements that in life can help you further, can help you achieve unimaginable things. But at other times, it's a distractor. It keeps you awake at night. It causes anxiety. It causes fear. It's, yeah, it's a global um, health-related issue almost. So how can we deal with this stress? What causes stress? Where are we on, on this topic in the business community? And what advantages can you see as a leader when there's a good balance between well-being and performance? Good. Richard, I want to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me uh, participate within the series. And thanks to everyone who's given up their precious time uh, for, this, uh, for this session today. Um, I'm going to jump right in um if if i may i, yeah, I think please. that um, for sure i think i think that we've all had uh, the most incredible year so challenging so many obstacles so many unknowns so many uncertainties when we started the year in january and february if we could have imagined something like this uh, it would have been science fiction at, at best or a netflix series it's it's almost unfathomable in terms of the conceptual model in terms of what's happened to us and how we've been impacted by us. And I think the best way to really reconcile the events of this year is to just look at some of the headlines that have presented themselves. The coronavirus, a once in a life, a once in a century health crisis affects to last decades, World Health Organization. You're looking at 170 countries potentially going into negative growth. You've got the worst crisis since World War II. The, a, a crisis that's comparable to the Great Depression. Um, you've got almost 50% of the world's labor force also not likely to keep their positions or, or hold on to their positions um, during the, the course of the year. And these are some of the headlines that have really presented from the World Health Organization, International Monetary Fund, the ILO, um, and other major institutions, including the UN. Now, that's just the the conceptual model this is you know we we theorizing in in many of these respects comparing it to previous disasters and previous challenges but if you look at the projected costs that were presented by a, a team of experts at the Center for risk studies um you're looking at the projected cost of the next five years to be in the region of 82 trillion dollars you also have the effect on human life 
at this point in time, we see 64 million people infected by the virus and their lives impacted. Now, what we see is this collision, the collision between economic uncertainties and health uncertainties and change and, and an overwhelming sense of fear. And this is driving stress to levels that we've never really experienced before. And we understand, we know, and, and we can fully appreciate that when the stress axis is ignited and turned on for protracted periods of time, it can corrupt our system. Stress in the short term offers us a survival advantage. It creates clarity, it creates energy, it creates focus. This is what short-term stress does for us. But the stress that we've all experienced, we've all experienced from March this year, and it's still ongoing, and, and there's no signs of it really relenting for the near future or immediate future, that type of stress is highly destructive. So the system that once protected us and helped us overcome adversity and challenges is now the system that is corrupting our very well-being. It's affecting us physically, it's affecting us emotionally, it's affecting us cognitively. And if we look at the screen and we say depression and anxiety and worry and low mood and cognitive decline, these are not abstract ideas. These are not things that happen to other people. These are experiences that we are having. We have had this year, we are having today, we had this week. Now, this reality, unfortunately, will materialize in a change in an organization, a change in a team, where you find that dynam dynamism reduces, creativity is impaired, trust diminishes, innovation collapses, competitiveness declines. Stress has this profound impact on self, on teams, on the entire workforce, and by doing so can change the trajectory can change the course and effectiveness of the business itself. Now, we do understand, we understand consciously and subconsciously that we are looking for leadership. Every single one of us wants someone to take the reins, wants someone to take charge and change the reality that we're experiencing now, change it for the better. So we are looking for leadership. But there's this challenge that exists at the same time. This challenge where trust is at a low point. And this, this was identified by the Edelman report that was released at Davos in January earlier this year. Trust in big business, trust in the media, trust in governments, NGOs, is at one of the lowest points in human history. Yet at the same time, we need leadership and we have to trust in order to be part of what we're looking for. But the interesting thing about this Edelman report is they identified that there is still trust that exists within the world. And trust is local because people still believe that their leaders and place of work have their best interests in heart or at heart. What I'm saying here is that the employees that come into work every day within your organization, your workforce, your teams, trust you. And this exists within 76, two three quarters, correction, three quarters of your workforce trust that you have their best interests at heart and you will look after their future, especially in the fiscal space. But at the same time, this trust is conditional now because trust in leadership demands that you participate in political events that you take a position on national challenges, national challenges such as COVID, that you champion employee health, that you take responsibility for environmental issues like going green, that you take a position and stand on diversity and inclusion, personal data protection, screening of, screening of fake news. All these are part of this new expanded role that leaders have. And this expectation that I'm presenting to you now, this expectation exists within 92% of the workforce within your organization. So what we're seeing now is a very interesting, interesting point in leadership because business leaders, team leaders, have to steer the organization in a direction of survival and competitiveness and profitability. But at the same time, and unlike almost any point before, leaders are responsible for safeguarding the lives and well-being of the people within and under their care. 
Now, there's pressure from the top in terms of results, success, and there's prefer pressure from the bottom in terms of safeguarding the well-being of those that look up to you, that believe in you, that believe that you have their best interests at heart. Now, what makes it so challenging, what makes it so difficult at this particular time is that you're up against a formidable opponent. So you expect it to perform in a supernatural and superhuman way at a time where you've got this convergence Convergence of COVID-19 on top of the fourth industrial revolution, where exponential change, exponential fear, exponential uncertainty is a given. This combination has created greater inequality than ever before. Lower productivity, health insecurity, skills instability, economic uncertainty, employment insecurity. This is just a small part of what we're experiencing now. And the world is looking to us looking to you to create the change that we need. Now, the interesting thing about this, this whole understanding and this whole conceptual model is that were it a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, the strategy would be vastly different. The strategy could be more simple. At this particular point in time, this once in a century event, we are living through history, we are living through one of the greatest challenges humanity has faced in recorded history. At this time, you need a very expansive game plan. You need to ensure that your teams, your people, the people that make a business to that make a business as great as it is, are performing to their potential. And how does one achieve that? So the first step is really to defend to defend against this formidable opponent, COVID-19 superimposed upon the fourth industrial revolution. And how does one achieve that? One, one creates a happy workforce and two, one creates an engaged team. In order to create a happy workforce, one has to reduce their stress. And in order to do that, you show more appreciation, more personal care, more support, Make them feel more valued. So this is part of the buffering system saying that these are the stresses that are coming at us. My role in leadership is to protect you from them to the best of my ability. But at the, second, at, at the same time, we have another challenge that just happiness in itself is not going to create the change that we need. We need to create engagement. We need our workforce to really bring their talent, bring their talent and really commit their time. And if we can get that time and talent superimposed on itself, that's where we create the change within a business and within society. So how do we create an engaged team? We make them feel important to the business. We give them a voice. We provide opportunities for them to grow and develop and evolve. We make them feel part of a collective and allow for autonomy. Fundamentally, this is listening to them, listening to what they have to say, hearing what the message is from the people that make the difference, and also providing the opportunity to grow, to expand, because the business will expand with them. So these are your best defenses in a very difficult time. But this is not enough. We have to go on attack. We have to get across the line, so to speak. And in order to do that, we have to lead. And leading requires that we create an inspired team where there's purpose and there's meaning within the organization, where people want to be the best that they can, where there's a mission at the same time, leadership is required to be aspirational, but most importantly, inspirational. The process of being inspirational, the infectiousness of inspiration, is what's going to create the difference at this time. Because as difficult as things are, as great as the challenges present, as uncertain as the world is, Within this time is great opportunity. 
Some of one's greatest achievements are born in crisis. Greatest accomplishments. Things that you look back and you're proud of. These are the times where they're born, they molded, they created, they invented. But in order to bring this out of ourselves and our team, the differentiator is inspiration. Now, the question is, why is inspiration right now so important? Is it the fact that the world is negative? Could be. But it's bigger than that. The fundamental reason why inspiration is so important is the fact that when we're inspired, we're able to unlock residual energy, untapped energy, energy known as discretionary energy. And we've all felt it where we have a, a very difficult week, a week that's really flat and we're struggling. And all of a sudden, towards the end of the week, something happens where there's a new opportunity. We recognize for something. Something switches and we become inspired. We become inspired to the extent we've got more energy. We've got more motivation. All the negativity dissipates. That is the power of inspiration. And in a world where pessimism and negativity and fears and uncertainty are so prevalent, this is the light. And the interesting thing about inspiration from a productivity standpoint within the workplace, as alluded to by Bain, by Bain and Company, was the fact that if you're able to take an unhappy employee, someone who's dissatisfied with their job, dissatisfied with their position, dissatisfied in their role, and you remove some of their stress, you make them feel valued, and you offer support, you create a satisfied employee, a satisfied member of your team. And by doing so, you'll increase their productivity by 40%. Now, if you take the satisfied employee and you give them a voice, give them a say in the decisions that affect them, give them authority, give them learning opportunities, make them feel part of a collective, you're going to take a satisfied individual, a satisfied member of your team, and increase their engagement to the extent where their productivity rises by 88% over and above satisfaction. But here's where the incredible happens, the impossible happens. Because if you take an already satisfied employee, someone who's happy with their job, happy in their role, happy to fulfill their responsibilities, and you give them purpose, you give them meaning, you give them something to aspire to, and you inspire them, that individual will become 125% more productive. And if you go from unhappy or dissatisfied to inspired, you're looking at a 300% increase in productivity. Now, can you imagine an entire team more productive to this degree or an entire organization? All the opportunities that exist right now, they're there for the taking. Who knows what potential exists beyond what we can see right now? But in order to unlock that potential, we need to bring out the best of people's talent, best of their abilities, and get them to commit their time. And this is the way to do it right now. Now, the tougher part is not so much the why. The why is this, this incredible change, this disassociation from negativity and this, this massive increase in productivity and commitment. The diff difficult part is the how. How do you inspire people? How do you change the way they view the world? Well, interestingly enough, there's four different levers that you can pull on. Four different ways in which you can transform the people that are around you. The first is through your own inner resources. If you're able to manage your stress in a crisis... If you are flexible when the world is becoming increasingly inflexible, if you're optimistic when everyone else is pessimistic, if you believe in yourself, if you express yourself, this inspires people. So many of the movies that we grew up watching, whether it's Rocky or there's countless movies, 
It was all about someone being optimistic and it was all about someone believing in themselves and overcoming adversity and challenges. And this is the power that it has. You finish watching one of those movies and you just feel like you can do anything. Anything is possible at that moment. And that's what you can do for the people around you if you yourself are able to lead in this way. So the question I want to put to you is of these characteristics, which one of these characteristics do you believe to be your strength? Your strength in inspiration. Because if you leverage off that, if you grow that, you're able to change your immediate environment, the environment that extends beyond that, and potentially entire organization. Is it your flexibility? Is it your optimism? Is it your self-belief? Is it your expression? What is your strength? What is your superpower? At the same time, we all have an inherent weakness. And of these five traits, which one do you believe that is the one that you would like to work on or should work on the most? Which brings me to the second lever. And the second lever is about setting the tone, setting the pace. At this time, where change is so rapid, it's so exponential, as the futurists call it. You have to be open to change. And change is difficult. But when we open to change, we inspire the people around us. You have to be able to follow through where no one else can. Take responsibility not only for your area of influence, but responsibility for other people's area of influence. You have to be selfless in a world that has become very self-absorbed. But at the same time, you always have to see the bigger picture. And it's in these times we, we can really identify with those inspirational figures that always saw the bigger picture, that were selfless, that took responsibility, that followed through, like Martin Luther King Jr. is a great example of that. So I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you before. Of these five characteristics, which do you believe to be your strength? Which is your superpower? Is it your adaptability? Is your ability to follow through no matter what? That grit factor? Is it the fact you take responsibility? Or is it the fact that you just have this clarity? You know what's beyond this point. And you're able to move your team, move the people that are under your care, within your care, within your sphere of influence, move them in a direction you know will be the right place. But my question is also, which is your weakness? Where is the limitation here? Could you be better on follow through? Could you be better on that bigger picture mentality? Where is your weakness? Where does it lie? Make a mental note, personal note, write it down. Which brings me to the third lever, which is connection. We understand the importance of connection. We really understand it. We, in good times, in bad times, the lockdowns have showed us explicitly how important it is to have this connection piece. Now, connection in terms of inspiration is about empathy. Empathy when the world is hard. It's about listening when people need to be heard. It's about humility when you are successful. It's about commonality in a world of difference. And it's about being assertive when the time demands of it. For me, the example, the prime example of this is Nelson Mandela. Someone who changed the world, saved the country through his empathy, through his ability to listen to each and every member of society, regardless of where they came from. His humility was his greatness. His commonality was unprecedented. He could connect to everyone all the time. There's not one person in South Africa who does not identify with the greatness of Nelson Mandela. But at the same time, he was no pushover. He was assertive. He knew what he wanted to achieve, and he achieved it. And this is what I'd like to ask you right now. What is your superpower here? What is your strength? Is your connection strength empathy? Is it the fact that you can listen to people? your humility, your assertiveness. 
which one of those is your strength at the same time reflect on your weakness where's your opportunity for growth where can you develop yourself in these times where we need to grow we need to move in order to be current in order to be successful in order to overcome the challenge that we're confronted with which brings me to the final lever and that is the lever that centers on leadership leading your team and we understand all great teams sports teams politicians businesses they all understand the message of focus we're inspired when, whenever we see individuals with extreme focus our athletes are a great example you look at a Novak Djokovic the focus it inspires us what he's able to achieve at the same time he has this direction he has a vision but he also empowers his team Novak's able to hand over to the experts he's able to co-create now why is that so important so we understand the value of focus and direction and vision in leadership but why is empowerment and co-creation on the same list the reason why is because not only do we inspire people when we ask them to play a part in our lives in our destiny in our journey but when they co-create when they give of themselves to the business to your team to a project it becomes them it becomes a part of them and they become inspired they inspire us and becomes infectious the power of co-creation and empowerment is unprecedented my final question to you is which is your strength in leadership is it your focus the fact that you can co-create the fact that you can keep the business or your team steered in the right direction your vision for the future your empowerment at the same time ask yourself this question where can i improve now we only need one not from each category we only need one one at an unprecedented level to create change in the world that we influence but here we're sitting at four so i've gone through this list and i've asked you the question which is your superpower you've got four superpowers one from each category four traits and characteristics that have the ability to change people's lives if you leverage off them if you amplify them there was always a belief in professional sport at a certain level you focus only on your strengths your strength is what will take you across the line will create that podium position but at the same time we're going to go one step further we're going to say yes we've identified four weaknesses and we're going to leverage off those strengths but we're also going to remedy those weaknesses focus on improving and this is the hard part it's easy to leverage off the strengths but to focus intensely on the weaknesses takes courage it also takes a certain degree of vulnerability so here we're seeing the model for the future but it's been a tough year it's been a challenging year for every single one of us and so many of us have arrived at this point on the 3rd of December and we're tired we're frustrated we burnt out we run down our resources are low and we understand the conceptual model we understand our role it's an expanded role we so much more is expected of us now than it was in the past and will be in the future but we have a greater influence than ever before we have the opportunity to change not only the destiny of your company but beyond but when we are feeling burnt out and we feeling run down and we feeling challenged how do we go about this how do we go about setting in motion something that's so critically important now 
something with so much social relevance? The answer lies with, within the concept of intrinsic potential. Where does our potential lie? If you want to be the best version of yourself so you can be the best version for others, so you can inspire them, so you can change the global landscape ultimately, one has to start with self. And your potential lies in two areas. The first is health. The healthier you are, the clearer you are, the more emotionally stable you are. And the more likely you are to capitalize on your exceptional abilities, your exceptional talents. But I think one thing we've really understood now more than ever before is the value of deep human connection. The importance of deep human connection in potential. We are only strong when we are together. We are only strong when we share. We are only strong when we protect. And if you go back to our ancestral past, you go back thousands of years, how did we overcome some of these challenges that were inconceivable? We didn't have the technology. We didn't have the medications. We didn't have vaccines. We didn't, but we got here. How did we do it? We protected our groups. We protected our communities. We protected each other. And we shared. And that defined us. And if we want to be strong again, strong as a collective, and you want to move the business forward and your teams forward and society forward, this has to be rebuilt on a platform of health. Now, the interesting thing is we see this, this health model is simplistic. Exercise, healthy diet, nutritional supplements, a little bit of time in nature, reframing, seeing things positively rather than negatively, vagal activities which encompass yoga, meditation, nurturing relationships, building relationships. We see these as, as positive, but we don't really understand the value. To give you a brief insight into the value, you have to understand that those activities that I've had on the screen there, the exercise, the good diet, the nutritional supplements, will create balance in these seven systems. Dopamine for clarity, BDNF for agility, neuropeptide Y to reduce anxiety, serotonin for mood stability and learning, norepinephrine for clarity, the stress axes, being able to control it at will, oxytocin will buffer everything. It's the stress antivenom. Those activities that I put on the screen before will elevate, will stabilize, will balance, will augment these molecules, and these molecules create a reality. So what I'm saying is if you want to make a difference in other people's lives, you start with yourself. Look after your well-being. Because if we do, we truly unlock our potential. Because those molecules fundamentally determine focus and courage and learning and memory and self-belief and physical strength and creativity. Everything that we aspire to is built into those seven systems. And those seven systems are influenced by health behaviors. And if these characteristics that are in front of you now are developed and augmented, we are able to inspire to levels that are unprecedented. We are able to create change that's exponential. And I want to leave you with a quote from someone who's inspired me over the many years. Someone who sadly passed away a couple of weeks ago. Probably one of the greatest social commentators in history. And I would say that the game plan for 2021 is epitomized by these thoughts or these sentiments. We are as great as our ideals if we truly believe in something beyond ourselves, we will achieve beyond ourselves. And that's where I'd like to close the presentation today. Thank you so much, Richard. That was truly, really inspiring. Um, well, I think it also raised a lot of thoughts, ideas, comments. So I think that's a really great, great uh achievement already to see that our audience is so much engaged about this topic i think it's also good that we share a few of those questions that people have shared via the comment box if, if that's okay with you absolutely 
Super. Uh, so actually, the, the, to, to go back to your final um, uh, thoughts about those different activities that you shared. So Rachel's asking us the simple question, actually, like, do we have to do all of those activities to be in a healthy balance? Or is there something that you can pinpoint out? Is yoga better than the other? Really practical question, I think. So, uh, amazing question because of its practicality. So fundamentally, if we were trying to manage our stress, remember, in order to manage, if we manage our stress as one of those personal resources that inspires others, if mm -hmm. we manage their stress, it creates a happy workforce. So it's, it's a really important feature, and I think it's a landing point. Now, the stress management protocols that existed in January or February this year were sufficient. But would they take us forward into 2021, 2022? Not sufficient. Mm -hmm. What we need is fundamentally a business plan for stress, a plan that really kind of looks at stress very objectively, saying, how do I manage my stress so successfully that I'm the best version of myself regardless of the circumstances? Mm -hmm. And there's fundamentally five parts to that. So just, uh, I'm sorry, that's going to be a little bit of a lengthy answer. So just uh, forgive me. That's but okay. The first step is really that reframing part is to see stress as an opportunity. Every challenge we have in our life is an opportunity to grow, to develop, to become the best version of ourselves. That is fundamentally step one. The way we see it is how it materializes. The second thing is to understand that our natural response is to go into a corner when we're stressed, is to remove ourselves from society, from our friends, from our family, from our colleagues, because we don't want to show vulnerability. We don't want to show weakness because society doesn't tolerate weakness and vulnerability anymore. But that's the worst thing that we can do because if we did the opposite where we were stressed and we're sharing our experience and we're supporting others through this experience, we're showing empathy and care and compassion, we would change our chemistry to such an extent that we'd be completely protected from the adverse effects of stress, especially in a mental health level or capacity. Mm -hmm. The third point is probably the most important is that because we are so stressed at the moment and stress is so protracted, it's going on and on and on. It's a combined winter with the lockdowns and the restrictions. We have to learn how to control stress because stress in the short term is an advantage, a tremendous advantage. But when it's off the leash, so to speak, it becomes dangerous. And there's activities that we can do to shut stress down, to turn it off at all. Within 30 seconds, we can turn off the stress, the biological effects of stress. Mm -hmm. The circumstances won't have changed. But our biological responses and the way it affects us will. And in order to achieve that, what's needed is activities that activate the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve being the master regulator of our stress responses. And these activities include meditation and yoga and breathing exercises. So that sits in its own category. The fourth, the fourth important point here in terms of the stress management at a very difficult time in human history is the fact that stress is associated with a decline in neurochemical stability. It's a decline in hormonal integrity. So we become weaker mentally, physically, and emotionally. And this is a time where we have to use activities like exercise to strengthen us hormonally and neurochemically. We have to take nutritional supplements and eat well in order to support us in a time where our system is very corrupted. So that's the fourth category. And the fifth category is very much based on resilience, the ability to to take stress and just stand up after we've been knocked down and to be able to adapt successfully to the demands that are placed on us. And that requires very much a calculated psychological mindset where we have to commit to be more adaptable, more agile, have goals, create self-worth and self-belief through different channels. And if you put this model together, these five parts, the reframe, connect with people, shut stress down, rebuild and build resilience, you have this incredible package, this package that will really propel you into the coming years. Wow. I think that that was a lengthy answer with a lot of value. So, Rachel, thank you for the question, but also for you, Richard, thanks so much for, for going in-depth on that. And I think it's really helpful for a lot of people to understand this system much better in terms of what regulates it, but also in terms of what influences your stress levels. Um, there's a few other questions I would like to ask you, which, which are coming from uh, from some of the of the audience questions. So one of them, Debayan, is asking us, so what leadership traits would be important and stand out in the future of work? So not looking back, but maybe looking forward in terms of not 2021, but maybe 2025. What, what, do you see like two or three of those like really special leadership traits? 
So, so I think special leadership traits, I mean, I, I won't go into a whole list because, I mean, it's very, very lengthy, but I think the, the one of the big points is, is solve um, as a leader. Solve your team's problems, solve your business problems, um, solve it quickly with efficiency, solve your community's problems. So I think that if you if there's a strong commitment to solving, the trust, the the commitment, the the whole ethical makeup of an organization becomes vastly different. Mm -hmm. the, the second point that I'd like to like bring into it is is it, it sounds like an irony is lead, and lead means that you've got to be aspirational, you've got to be inspirational. You have to be regulated. Everything that you want people to be, you have to live it because communication is very much through actions as, a, as opposed to exclusively words. So I think if you live the model that you want your teams to embody, that vision will create incredible change. Wow. I think, yeah, taking decisions really show the way forward. That's definitely a trait that you want to improve maybe as one of your key strengths to, uh, well, if you... Talk about the growth and the strengths parts. Definitely, there's a lot to improve probably with the people that uh, that are participating here as well. Now, the question of Peter, and I think that rel relates to this, is if leadership is key, is key, so if leadership is key to get us out of this crisis, why do we see so much failed leadership during the crisis? Now, to me, this is a bit maybe also in the eye of the beholder because I think, yeah, some might see it as failed leadership while others see it maybe an improvement in leadership, but do you, how do you look at this? Do you see this as well in the crisis? So uh, the interesting thing is that um, this, there's two different brands of leadership. Um, there's a brand of leadership that is exceptional, exceptional outside of a crisis. Um, that there's clarity, there's purpose, there's optimal decision making. But there's also, conversely, challenges. The minute there is a crisis and there's instability and things aren't going well and uh, there's a lack of predictability and your back's against the wall, sometimes those leaders are not the best um, in those situations. At the same time, you have exceptional leaders in crisis where the more chaotic, the calmer they are. The more frenetic, the more clarity they have. These individuals have an exceptional ability to rise to the occasion and when the crisis is over, they disappear. And then you get a select few, the, the smallest of smallest group, who can lead well out and who can lead well in. And I think so much of this, this leadership in crisis, there is, there is a genetic component, very much so. I mean, it actually relates to a, a specific gene called the comp gene, where some people are really exceptional in outside and some people are really exceptional inside a crisis. Um, but I think what we have to understand is that leadership has changed. It's changed vastly. And a lot of people have been trained for managerial leadership, but not so much leadership in these times where you have to think a lot quicker. You, you've got to make decisions without having all the information. You've got to have the bigger vision and, and not focus on the smaller details. So I think that the whole style of leadership has changed so rapidly that a lot of the existing leaders have not adapted at the same pace as society has changed. There are exceptions where some people have just really thrived and excelled under these very hostile and difficult conditions. Is there a way, I mean, you're, you're also in contact with a lot of these, different, well, elite athletes, these guys, they, they were training for Olympic finals in Tokyo for this year, or, or they were having so many yeah, goals set for the future. And the setback was enormous back in March, April, May, when, when they were looking at their future and considering yeah, the nine months ahead might... I, I might not be able to even train normally. How, how do you help them? What's a practical way of taking their lead the, to lead them forward? So that's, that's an amazing, you? that's such a great question. It's such a great question because what they go through um, in a period like this is what all of us are going through now. And what they're going through is tremendous insecurity and uncertainty about their future. Many of them have sacrificed education to be in this, this role. Many of them have this once in a lifetime chance on only in a, a four year period, once in their life, are they going to be able to peak to the extent that they can hold up their gold medal and they can get the endorsement, get the sponsorships to create a secure future. With that removed, their financial security is removed, their job is taken away, their motivation is taken away, so much has been taken away. It's almost amplified what's happening to all of us in terms of the, the changes that have existed. The unemployment, in, uh, you know, 50% of the world's force was, was at risk of losing their jobs. I don't mm -hmm. know how many uh, did, but I think a significant part of the world's workforce uh, were not able to retain uh, a, a, a 
uh, employment. So the, the question that, that you've asked has actually been answered before. Um, there's most of these individuals training for the Olympics on exceptional sets. Um, not all of them are going to stand on the podium and hold a gold medal, but there's a select few that does, and we can learn from that select few. So in, in these type of disappointing situations and environments, in these type of challenging um, uh, periods in life, the interesting thing about this group of athletes is they're exceptionally resilient. And we use that word very, very flu fluidly where it's, it's used all the time and probably not in context. Now, their resilience stems from the fact that they always see a stress as an opportunity. They always remove themselves from the stress as well and say that Corona is not the reason why. It's, well, the, the fact that Tokyo was canceled is not the reason why. I'm going to start introspecting. How am I feeling about this and how can I control my feelings? How am I thinking about this? How can I control my thoughts? How am I acting on this and how can I control those actions? And that the most important thing is how, what actions can I take in order to secure and improve my future? There's this adaptability and this, almost this agility that, that spontaneously um, uh, comes into, into the fore. Now, there was a, a very large, excuse me for the long answer again. It's, it's one of the, the long ones. <laughs> So there was a great study. Oh, wow. so that's a good thing. <laughs> it, it was, uh, there was a great study looking at Olympic champions. So individuals that are, over the many decades have been able to hold up that gold medal and say, I've done what everyone else tried to do, and I wasn't necessarily the most talented, but I was able to achieve it, and how they achieved it. And when they went through the history and they interviewed all these individuals, and it was a considerable number of athletes that they, they went through over many decades, many different Olympics, what they found was they had these key psychological resources that we can all learn from, these characteristics that were really entrenched in them that didn't exist to the same degree in the other Olympians. And these characteristics were existed that were motivation. Mm -hmm. They were tremendously motivated. So sometimes it was motivated for recognition. They did what they did because they want to be recognized, or they did what they did because it gave them self-worth, or they did what they did because... They had nothing else uh, to fall back on, but there was a strong sense of motivation and it got them, no matter what the circumstances, they'll be telling themselves, well, if it's canceled now, it's going. they'll have a different form of games next year or they'll have some sort of compensation. They've already motivated themselves and they've already kind of moved themselves to the next place while everyone's kind of still thinking about uh, the aftermath of, of Tokyo. So motivation was important, but a lot of the motivations weren't fear-based. They were the positive uh, motivations. The second thing is that they were extremely confident and they also understand that the fact that their confidence is built on success. So all of our success in life is built on the fact that we've achieved things and that's what really kind of builds us up and props us up on an emotional and intellectual level. Mm -hmm. Now, in a, in a time like this where we can't compete and we don't, we don't really know where we're holding and we, we can't, there's no benchmark, it does impact our confidence. And the interesting thing about these Olympic champions is when their confidence was impacted, what they tend to do is not focus on what's going on around them, whether it's COVID-19 and a shutdown, or are we going to compete and is it my last year? They don't focus on that, but they go back to the past and they start running through the events where they were successful and repeated and repeated and repeated and remind themselves of their greatness. And I think it's a lesson we can all take where if we go back to some of our previous successes, whether it was getting a certain degree or whether it was getting a certain job or whether it was achieving something on a project and just saying, I, you know, I, I really kind of outdid myself. I'm really proud of myself. And, and just that's what we're capable of. And we can actually excel beyond, beyond that. That's just the beginning point. But this was another characteristic they have. But... One of, the, one of the, the real things that, that kind of stood out with this group is they understood the value of support. Mm -hmm. They understood that their success was not built on them. It was not built on their individual achievements. It was built on the people that support them and surround them. And they really acknowledge that. And the, they surround themselves by people who can who really prop them up in terms of self-worth and value and help them instrumentally. So these, these are some, I mean, I'm not going to go into the full list, but there's these key resilience characteristics. And they... It's something that's so entrenched, so intrinsic that they'll switch straight into that gear and they'll start creating new opportunities for themselves um, almost instantaneously. Impressive. Thanks for, very much for sharing that. Um, also because of bound of time. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit well hesitant. I know that people are busy. There's, it's busy weeks as well, closing off to the year. But I do have one final question that I feel is really relevant, which also relates to a factory in a way. But I think Rebecca nailed it in terms of um, well, what she's struggling with probably is, is her question about how can we connect, listen, be empathetic um, 
if we're not able to meet, even those sports players or the people that they want to benchmark, how can we really, but maybe bring it from the leadership perspective? How can I really connect with my people if it's on an online screen or, or yeah, maybe if I don't even see them for seven, 10, 12, maybe if this pandemic lasts for two years, who knows? What, what, what would be your recommendation there? So, so there's, there's two points of, of entry on this. Um, the one is that if you're running a team, um, you have a big team, um, the ways that in which you can use anonymized data where people are checking in on a weekly basis in terms of their strength, their mood, their resilience. Um, I actually developed a, a technology piece for this purpose during COVID um, be, right. because of the challenge. Um, and the anonymized data tells the story. Um, it tells the story of where people are holding, what's stressing them the most, what concerns they have the most, where their strengths are lying in this time. Um, and it, it gives us an action an action point. So I think that technology is actually one of the big points that we, we need to access at this time. One of the, the other points that I'd like to raise, and sometimes a bit more challenging with big teams, is there has to be some sort of personal interaction. And this was really... Something that uh, that was uh, brought to my attention about a year or two ago, uh, one of the one of the top CEOs in the world um, is a very pe people centric um, individual, um, and he runs a really large company in the U.S., non listed, uh, with a couple of b billion dollars. And uh, his his whole strategy is that he will check in on people personally once a week, uh, pick up the phone um, onto a, a Zoom, whatever. 10 minutes not related to work, 15 minutes not related to work in his larger, broader team. Um, and, and beyond his team, he has all his leaders um, doing the same with their teams. And he creates that personal connection piece. And that's so important in this time because so much of human communication is, is not, it's not verbal, it's not auditory. It's, there's this energetic exchange that, that happens. And we know that 90, 95% of communication is nonverbal. Um, so we, we do remove that. But if we can get anonymized data just giving us a sense on where people are holding and what the general mood is, we can take steps in order to prevent and protect and buffer, as I said earlier. But at the same time is to get. I think we lost the connection. We're looking into we're this. We're ah, we're back, Richard. We're Sorry. Back. We're back. We're back. Yeah, so we've, we've, there's a lightning storm here. So, so my, ah. my apologies. So your your final thoughts were maybe to share the final thought on on. So you said there's no personal connection right now. Difficult to interact via the screen. Yeah. You so the example of the CEO checking in on people individually. Yeah. So so what's what's um the what's what this particular brand of leadership which i think uh, even harvard did a big paper on it um this this people-centric brand of leadership where ceos in their the team that they that, that report directly to them every single week they'll make a time whether it's 15 minutes 10 minutes to check in on their personal lives um it's, it's just something that builds the relation builds the connection um and then they encourage their leaders um, of that within the organization and their teams to do the same and it just it's infectious and everyone gets to know each other so much better on a personal and deeper level and you know the, the more we share the more we become connected to each other so so i think that was a very powerful tool and i think that all leaders can benefit from that and and you combine that with pers uh, anonymized data just kind of understanding um, you know, it's, I, I know you're trying to achieve a, a people element and a personal element, but sometimes um, there is this reflection as a collective, what the mood is at the moment, what people are struggling with, and uh, it will help with the solution set. Wow. Thanks so much. So I'm really sorry to say that we're bound on time uh, because I think we could talk about this for another two hours if, if the thunderstorm allows us. <laughs> uh, maybe as a final thought, because I, we we keep getting in more questions, so there's definitely people interested to to well have a have a personal conversation. W where can people reach you? How can people reach out to you? What's the best way? Uh, the best way is just get onto my website at suttonhealth.co.za, um, and just uh, you can connect uh, through through the websites or uh, through that platform. It's probably the easiest. Okay, that's that's really great to know. Well, thanks so much from our side. Um, yeah, I can't thank you enough. I think this was inspirational, but also very useful also for, for these last weeks of the year, but maybe also drawing your plan for 2021. What are you going to do? How are you going to improve building on your strengths? But also, what can you grow in? So, Richard, thanks very much. Uh, and, and yeah, really, I hope to see you again, uh, who knows, in a few months, looking Likewise. back at a turbulent time. 
Likewise, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was such a pleasure to to be able to participate in this forum. Super. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank Good, you. Um, well, to, to everyone watching, uh, yeah, this was the last Effectory broadcast of the year. It's been a really great pleasure for me also together with my colleagues and also with everyone that participated, our really inspiring guests. Uh, of course, Richard, but yeah, many others that have joined to talk about performance management, employee experience, listening, the things we've done together, um, uh, considering the HR trends analysis, Back in March, we started with considering how we could use the crisis as an accelerator, as a catalyst with Tom Hack. And now we're nine months further. And, and yeah, back then we thought after COVID. And I think now we're going to discuss next topics with COVID or what's our future of work going to look like. And I'm really looking forward to the next year. It's going to be a great year, I think. Um, we already have lined out a few inspiring speakers. So I'm already inviting you for the 14th of January when Martin Barnick an organization for global product development at Novartis Sandoz. You might know them as one of those big medicine pharmaceutical producing companies. Uh, and he's going to talk about people and culture at Novartis, which is really an extraordinary, different, yeah, new way of looking at people, at looking at culture around, around them in the business, but also taking into account some of these notes that Richard just mentioned. Listen to your people, engage them, inspire them. They have a truly authentic way of looking at that. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I'm hoping to invite you to this as well. If you're interested to hear more about a factory, if you want to learn more in the next weeks while you're at home in the Christmas break, you're sitting at your fire, wood fire, and you think, let's get some inspiration, go on to our factory.com website, chat with us using the hashtag effectoryhrlab, or go to our YouTube channel where you can find all these recordings and look back at all this inspirational uh, messages that, that people have gathered over the last nine months. Please don't forget, if you come up with an interesting idea, if you have something to share with our audience yourself, please share that with us. Do reach out. Yeah, I want to thank uh, our technician, Eric, who's been here every time, our producers, and of course, uh, all the speakers and, and my colleagues here at the factory as well. And then I'm looking forward to see you uh, after the Christmas break. Enjoy your time and see you in the new year.